Hello, Newsweeds fans. This is Gary Loss, and I'm going to bring you some information on the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, just recently signed by President Biden into law. I'll give you a breakdown of some of the basic things in there, and also provide a little bit of commentary, too. All right, so with that, let's move forward. So first of all, we're going to have a couple of focuses or foci. Uh, the first one is what's in it. The second one is what's not in it. And then focus through what are some issues. In particular, I'm talking about fiscal or funding problems, uh, especially noted by the CBO and also historically speaking, what might be some issues. So focus number one, what's in it. And most of this information comes from CNN.com. They provided the best breakdown. So first of all, it will deliver $550 billion of new federal investments in America's infrastructure over five years, okay? So this is a, uh, a spending program that takes place over some time. Uh, it'll touch everything from bridges and roads to the nation's broadband, water, and energy systems. So it's fairly comprehensive. So let's break it down. First of all, there's $110 billion for roads, bridges, and major infrastructure projects. And this includes the following. There's other things too, but these are the highlights. $40 billion for bridge repair, um, either replacing bridges or rehabilitating bridges. And then $16 billion for major projects that would be too large or complex for traditional funding programs. And what that means is probably yet to be decided because they have to codify all this and regulators have to get involved and it's that's down the road. But there is $16 billion for other type of projects. $11 billion for transportation safety. That could be with high-speed rail or involving um, improvements to cars or roads or bridges, things that would make us safer. And then $1 billion to reconnect communities. There are communities, especially rural communities in the South particularly, where when we built the, uh, the interstate highway system, they were often cut off from one another and not able to uh, able to see each other. So this will at least in theory remedy that and reconnect these uh, sort of marginalized distant communities. And then there's some money on climate change mitigation. I don't know exactly what that means, but those are all things that have to be written into code as we move forward. All right, what else? The funds will repair and upgrade existing infrastructure and make stations accessible to all users, bring transit service to new communities and modernize rail and bus fleets. So this is all about rails and buses and, and allowing those things to be, uh, I guess, more robust and serve a wider audience. Uh, now, part of this is a, a gambit in, in a sense, a bet that zero emissions Vehicles are going to be part of the equation here, so you can see an environmental aspect. So a lot of vehicles are going to be replaced with zero emission models. Whether there's an actual demand for that or not, I don't know yet. Um, all that will have to be worked out. There is money for transit and rail. Um, in particular, $39 billion to modernize public transit, and this is something that we probably are in need of. Uh, our, our trains are quite old and as are the tracks, so they have not had an upgrade in, in a while in many places, especially on the East Coast, where they're used the most. Uh, $66 billion for passenger and freight rail in particular. And then $12 billion in partnership grants for inner city rail service. Okay, I, I can tell you that I come from a, a, a city originally, Houston, Texas, that had a high-speed rail there was a lot of money spent on it. I think it was millions of dollars per mile. It is highly underutilized and I'm not criticizing it. There are cities that if it's done correctly where this can be very helpful, but sometimes cities do it in a way that doesn't really do anything to improve the movement of people from one place to another. So we'll see, $12 billion is not a ton of money in terms of you know a federal allocation, but we'll see where this goes. All right, so there's broadband upgrade, uh, money for that. $65 billion in particular to improve the nation's broadband infrastructure. And then here's a quote for you. It aims to help lower the price 
Households pay for internet service by requiring federal funding recipients to offer a low cost affordable plan. Basically, it's a subsidy. By creating price transparency, I'm not quite sure what that means. I know what that means. I'm not quite sure how that is realized uh, in terms of the federal government uh, because they're not exactly known for transparency, but what we shall see. And by boosting competition in areas where existing providers aren't providing adequate service. Again, I would think that's some kind of subsidy to competition, um, and that could be problematic. It could be helpful because it could lower price. It could be problematic because if those companies aren't really financially solvent, if they don't have good models, they just end up going out of business and then you're back to where you were and you spent all that money. So some issues with that, but that's what's basically in this broadband upgrade. Uh, $17 billion in port infrastructure and $25 billion for airports. As you know, if you've been in an airport recently, we definitely need to upgrade um, these systems. So these is, this, is, this money is to repair uh, and address maintenance backlogs, reduce congestion and emissions near ports and airports. So again, uh, emissions, there's a uh, environmental component of this all throughout. And this is part of this part with uh, port infrastructure and airports. And then again, the push for electrification and other low carbon uh, technologies. And of course that could be debated whether they're truly low carbon or not, given that they are uh, deriving their uh, charge via electricity, which is also created through coal. But nonetheless, that's that's the plan. What else? Electric vehicles. Again, there's this big focus on electric vehicles. Quite a bit of money, $7.5 billion for zero and low emission buses and ferries. And $7.5 billion will go to building a, a nationwide network of plug-in vehicle chargers. This is probably something that's needed. Uh, I do have friends that have these cars, and it's not always reliable to find a station to charge your vehicle. So hopefully this will address that. What's in it also? Improving power and water systems. $65 billion to rebuild the electric grid, which is a need in, uh, a, a serious upgrade. And $55 billion to upgrade water infrastructure. My sense is that that is probably not enough money. In fact, I know it's not enough money. Flint, Michigan alone would require a significant uh, amount of money. Uh, from what I've read, that needs to be probably double or triple to really address the problems that we have with our water infrastructure here. But it's at least a step in the right direction. $50 billion will go towards making the system more resilient, protecting it from drought, floods, and cyber attacks. Again, this is a nod toward uh, climate change and a sort of mitigating component of this spending package. And speaking of environmental uh, remediation, there is specifically $21 million, billion, excuse me, billion dollars earmarked to clean up Superfund sites, these toxic waste dumps and so forth, uh, also known as brownfield sites. And then some money to reclaim the abandoned mine land and cap orphan gas well so, so sort of just do some general cleanup and I, i'm guessing that there's already money allocated for that to begin with in the budget this is probably extra money to take care of some of these loose ends now what's not in it because there was a whole bunch more money that uh, president biden and and congressional democrats wanted and it didn't happen. Um, they had to compromise, which is the way that our system works. But um, one thing that's absent was 400 billion to bolster caregiving for aging and disabled Americans. Now that's a, a, a bold uh, initiative. There was of course the argument that that is not really an infrastructure. The argument from the Democrat side was that's human infrastructure and then we get into semantics. But basically that huge chunk of money Almost half a trillion dollars is off the table. It's not in there anymore, okay? Um, that's a big deal in terms of the, these two groups, like caregiving um, caregivers and then the aging that they'll be taking care of, as well as disabled Americans. These are people who tend to be, in many cases, underserved. So now there's not money for that. And whether that's a good or a bad thing, I don't know, but it's not in there. Um, there's also $100 billion that was supposed to initially go to workforce development, including helping kids uh, pick career paths in high school. That is 
been stripped from the bill. Uh, also missing is $18 billion for that Biden had proposed to modernize veterans affairs hospitals. We know that that's probably just a drop in the bucket, given what problems we've heard, given the problems that we've heard about uh, the veterans affairs problems, um, in particular, their hospitalization and med medical systems are often understaffed. Um, over, uh, the people there are overworked and they often don't give the patients the best care. We've all heard these things. So that money is no longer going there. I'm not sure why that amount, which is really not that much in the bigger picture, got cut. But sadly, that is not in there. One of the things that Biden wanted to do was to raise the corporate in income tax rate to 28%. That is off the table, although uh, congressional Democrats have said that they're going to revisit this issue in the future and hope to attack it from another angle, like separate legislation or through the tax code. Anyway, right now it is not in this uh, new bill. So for now, corporations are going to remain at the rate that uh, Trump had in, in office, which I believe is 21%. And so we're going to move on without that. Now, there's some issues here on a, a fiscal side, you know, in terms of taxing and spending, essentially. Uh, it was supposed to be a neutral bill, fiscally neutral bill, meaning that it didn't add to the deficit. Uh, that is not true. The CBO has found out that it adds roughly $350 billion to the deficit over 10 years, so approximately $35 billion a year, which, given that we've been spending, you know, one, 1 1.2, 1.5 trillion, whatever enormous funds we've been spending beyond our means is not all that much more, but it does add to it, right? Uh, and then uh, looking at that 50 page, uh, 57 page summary of the legislation, lawmakers leaned heavily on repurposing unused COVID-19 relief funds to pay for the legislation. So there, were money, there was money set aside for COVID-19 relief. They've now repurposed that money. Now some issues. Uh, with that. First of all, the CBA, CBO, Congressional Budget Office, this is the nonpartisan group that scores these bills in terms of uh, their fiscal responsibility. The CBO found that these measures would provide roughly $22 billion in savings, not the $263 billion. Well, that is a big deal, right? Now you're talking another $241, what, $241 billion that are, is going to be added to the deficit because these funds are not enough to pay for it. So again, this idea that it's neutral as usual is probably not going to pan out to be true. All right. The other thing is, and this is just something that occurred to me, we're not out of this COVID thing yet. And whether you agree in government helping or not, they had help in the past. If we take another hit, like another uh, variant comes along and the vaccines, God forbid, are not effective against that variant, we could be back to where we were before. That's unlikely to happen. I don't think that'll happen. We also have medications to attenuate that. But let's just say that happens. Now we don't have that money. They'd have to repurpose that money. There would be lag time in that. It would be fighting Congress over that. That could be problematic if we need that money going down the road. So I think that may be a bit of a dangerous gambit, maybe not the riskiest thing ever, but still a risk. Of course, uh, if you're trying to be neutral, you have to do things like these, like uh, these measures. But I just want to point it out that that could be a problem and it could come back to bite us at a later point. Um, the other thing is that there's $53 billion from states opting to terminate the pandemic unemployment benefits early. So again, we're, we're, we're relying on what states did in the past, the states that cut off monies to, to people. What if those states then get a new governor, right? New leadership, and now they wanna use that again. That means that that money won't be saved anymore. There could be problems with this. All right, what else? There was some money that was supposed to be saved um, through what's called spectrum 
auctions through the uh, Federal Communications Commission? Well, uh, the, there was some analysis and, the, and it is going to generate far less than $87 billion originally claimed by lawmakers. So the money from the COVID relief is not going to be as much as money as they thought it was going to be. And this is not going to be as much money. Again, these are, these are all accumulating in a way that would not make this a neutral spending bill, but would end up adding significantly to the deficit. It could end up billions of dollars more than what we thought. And again, as I pointed out, every president and every Congress going back to uh, all the way to Reagan when it started kind of exploding, uh, especially under President Obama and then again under, under President Trump, we have to get a handle on this. And this may not be adding tons of money to it. And maybe the investment will be worth it long term. But at some point, we have to be careful because all of this money is going to be passed on to the next generation. They're going to have to pay for it. If these things aren't going to work out as well as they think it is, then they're, then uh, our kids are basically going to be saddled with this cost. Here's the other thing. The infrastructure package relies on generating $56 billion in economic growth, and it banks on a 33% return on investment. <laughs> long term. Okay, maybe it will and maybe it won't, but that is a huge return. I don't know about you, but usually in my in the highest the best part of the economy when it's really booming and the stock market's taking off, I've hit around 20% in the past. Average is much less than that, between 5 and 10%. I don't know how the federal government somehow thinks they're going to hit a 33% target, that's quite a bit. So when you add all these things up, what it says is that this is going to cost us much more than what they're saying it is, potentially, and maybe not. And by the way, long-term, it may offset these, this spending, depending how much we do end up going over. So there's a lot of unknowns here going forward. The other thing is, and then I'll leave it at this, is inflation. Let me stop sharing here for just a moment. Inflation is a huge issue here. I reported on this through articles, through videos. If this inflation that we have now persists for a number of years, let's say two, three, four years going down the, the road, even at a rate of 5%, which it seems like modest, it won't be modest, and here's why. It will erode consumers' ability to spend on the things that Congress is expecting them to spend. It'll put a net drag on uh, our GNP and our GD GDP. It will cause uh, unemployment and worsen the whole job uh, systems that, that are going on out. The employment systems will be damaged. All of that will end up negatively impinging on this spending because our economy won't be robust enough to make use of the investments that are made. Now, this is not rocket science, and I'm not trying to say I'm an economist, but this is something that the government has got to get under control because it wouldn't necessarily ruin it, but it may damage it to a degree. Inflation is sort of nefarious even when it's at a fairly low rate, like 4 and 5%, because cumulatively, end over end, year over year, it just eats away at our economic growth, and that will eat away at our ability to both pay for and utilize the things that the spending targets. So ambitious, not as ambitious as it was when Biden started this whole project, but ambitious. Some of these things are needed. Others, maybe not so much. We could debate about it. How they all shake out is really the bigger question, right? How will they all shake out? That is going to be determined by states and by regulators and including federal regulators. There's intention over here and then there's reality over here and, and they are often widen as time goes on, right? Well, hopefully they're closer. But the way that laws are written, things just don't always translate the way that they're supposed to. So 
let's hope that this money is spent prudently and wisely and that it actually does something to help the average American, because then if it does, you know, it'll be worth it. All right. This is Gary Loss with Newsweed. Have a great day. Bye-bye.